Sound then revolutionised the film industry, with the first talkie, The Jazz Singer, premiering in 1927, which featured a trailer which showed a man saying that he is... ...privileged to say a few words to you in this most modern and novel manner. This trailer was pitched to audiences as the only way they could see this revolutionary new sound technology. Trailers didn't change much over the next 25 to 30 years. Then Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho came along. In this trailer, Hitchcock himself takes us on a six-minute guided tour of the Bates Motel and includes loads of detail about the mystery and the gruesome murders of the story to try to entice audiences to see it. You see, even in daylight, this place still looks a bit sinister. Now, it was at the top of these stairs that the second murder took place. She came out of the door there and met the victim at the top. Of course, in a flash, there was the knife, and in no time, the victim tumbled and fell with a horrible crash. I think the bat broke immediately and hit the floor. It was, it's difficult to describe the way that the, the, the twisting of the, of the, well, I, it's, uh, I won't dwell upon it, but let, let, come upstairs. According to David Fear, Hitchcock wanted to break away from traditional trailer formats, which included hyperbolic praise and hyperventilating promotion of stars. Next came Jaws. Not only did Jaws reinvent the idea of the summer blockbuster, it also revolutionised the way that films were marketed on television. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change, without passion, and without logic lives to kill a mindless eating machine it will attack and devour anything it is as if God created the devil and gave him Jaws is credited as being one of the first films to utilise the primetime advertising slot on television. Universal spent an estimated $700,000 on releasing 30-second clips of the film in the three days prior to its release. Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfuss. You're going to need a bigger boat. From the best-selling novel, Jaws, rated PG, may be too intense for younger children. Moving from small screen blitz marketing to small screen but big time event marketing, Independence Day was one of the first films to have a trailer advertised during the 1996 Super Bowl. The Independence Day trailer built excitement by speaking directly to the audience and by also showing the infamous White House explosion money shot. Independence Day. Trailers have now become a huge part of the Super Bowl, with distributors paying millions to make sure that their summer blockbusters are advertised in the halftime slot and excitement is built months before the film is actually released. Over the next 20 years, trailers became a hugely popular form of media. Nowadays, there are YouTube accounts specifically created for trailer review and trailer reaction devices. There are now even different categories of trailers, with studios releasing red band trailers which show more risque parts of the films to more adult audiences in the hope of enticing them to come and see the films too. Now that we know what trailers are about and where they came from, we need to learn a little bit more about how they actually help to promote films and get those larger audiences in. To give us a bit more of an idea about this, here is a short animation detailing the absolute madness that surrounded the release of the first trailer of Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace.
But what kind of work actually goes into making a trailer? And what kind of devices and techniques do filmmakers use in order to make their trailers appeal over other trailers? We recently spoke to some local filmmakers about how they use trailers to promote their films. Hello, I'm Sam. I'm part of the YouTube channel Black Plasma Studios, where we create cinematic content using video games. Um, we generally use games to make our movies, so we tell stories using games like Halo, um, and most recently we use Minecraft um, through animation. My name's David. I'm more known as Arbiter617, is my online alias. I make machinima, or animations. Uh, machinima is basically using an existing game engine to make movies using the engine. And of course, animations, I do original things in 3D software such as Blender. I do a lot of Minecraft animations. Uh, about eight, almost nine years now, maybe, I believe. Uh, back at the beginning, I was mostly just doing the machinima, which was using the game engine. But as I got better and better at it, I found that it was a little more restrictive. So I moved on to animation where I have full control over my, you know, my character movements, facial expressions, etc. Uh, yes, we do use trailers to promote our movies. Um, generally, we usually release like a teaser trailer about six months before the movie is scheduled to come out. And then we usually release like a full trailer, which is, has a bit more story, uh, about a couple of weeks before it comes out, with probably a release date at the end of it as well. Um, and it, it does really impact the, uh, the outcome of how many people end up watching it. Um, it generally builds excitement really well. Uh, we release trailers to obviously help build excitement for a movie, to get the publicity for it, to help people uh, understand what the story is about uh, briefly, don't want to give too much away. Uh, sometimes we also use trailers as almost a filler to kind of keep people uh, happy before the movie comes out because it might take a long time to make the movie so at least releasing a trailer they can see something a bit earlier on instead of having to wait you know, six, seven, eight months before the movie is released. No, for my shorts, pretty much, I don't do any trailers because the length of a trailer would have been, you know, 20% of the movie or shorts or whatever. Um, however, things about six minutes or so is working. You just start doing like a little short teaser. But even then, and I don't want to do like even a 30 second teaser would be a good portion of the whole animation or something. Usually I do it for my ones that are more like 20 to 20 minutes to two hours or something. Um, usually for me, uh, editing a trailer usually starts off with choosing a good set of music. Uh, usually it's good to cut trailer to the music, it helps with um, building excitement, editing shots to certain cues in the music. Um, uh, but usually uh, selecting a genre is probably most important if you want the tone to be quite dark and mysterious or if you want it to be exciting and fast paced. So usually the mood and the music are the main factors on the construction of the trailer. Um, usually selecting information to put in the trailer, like footage, um, is a very time consuming process because you don't know what to reveal um, to the audience. Um, so that usually takes a lot of time. I wouldn't say lie. I think if you were just straight up lying, you'll definitely get more negativity in the end. It's, it's never going to be worth it to lie about your stuff. Because once the viewers find out the truth about the movie, you know, everyone will just critique it negatively and you're going to lose your reputation. However, you can certainly kind of change things in your favor. For example, usually, you know, you show the more exciting things or the, you know, the best parts of the movie to make it feel more exciting. And you, you don't just show, you know, walking and talking shots for a whole trailer. There's going to be a lot of action. It is obvious that in order to attract larger audiences, trailers are made up of the best parts of a film. But what do filmmakers do to avoid giving away important plot points within trailers? In this way, trailers are edited and manipulated so that audiences aren't shown key aspects of films. This was the case with the 2004 movie Million Dollar Baby, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture. The film stars Clint Eastwood as a retired boxing coach and Hilary Swank as a female boxer 
who enlists his help to become a professional. Susan Vloschener wrote in her review for USA Today that the film packs a surprising plot twist. This plot twist consists of the fact that Eastwood decides to euthanise his protégé after she becomes a ventilator-dependent quadriplegic. This plot twist created huge problems for both Warner Brothers and for critics. Critics felt it was their responsibility to keep spoilers away from viewers, but also felt like they had a duty to inform religious viewers about the upsetting and potentially controversial twist at the end of the film. Warner Brothers decided not to focus on the third part of the film in regards to marketing, and instead decided to advertise the film as some sort of female Rocky Balboa. This led to some viewers feeling a bit duped that they'd gone to see the film with this in mind, but overall it was felt like this was a good decision in regards to the religious aspects of the story. Now, what is the rule? Protect myself at all times. Good. Find a man, marry him. People hear about what you're doing and they, they laugh at you. <laughs> I got nobody but you, Frankie. Well, you've got me. I made a lot of mistakes in my life. I'm just trying to keep you from doing the same. I know, boss. Good man to have in the corner. Yes, he is. Hey, hey get the hell down, you old ass. I just want to keep her with me. You just protected yourself out of a championship. Frankie, I've seen you in mass almost every day for 23 years. The only person who comes to church that much is the kind who can't forgive himself for something. You got a fight I don't know about? You gonna leave me? Never. Warner Brothers may have dodged a bullet here, but clearly marketing a film differently isn't always the best idea, as shown by the 2007 film Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. The film, directed by Tim Burton, stars his favourite collaborators, Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter as Sweeney Todd and Mrs Lovett, respectively. The film follows Todd and Lovett's bizarre and gruesome partnership in a London barbershop as Todd searches for his revenge. Despite the film being a musical, only 20 seconds of the 150 second long trailer showed any singing at all. Alright! You sir! No one's in the chair, come on, come on! Sweeney's waiting, I want you bleeders. You sir! Two sir! Welcome to the grave. I will have vengeance. I will have salvation. This fooled some audience members into thinking that the film was centred on horror and gore and that it wouldn't be the all singing, all dancing feast that it was. Louis Lazar of the Chicago Sun Times described this technique as bait and switch marketing. Lazar suggested that Warner Brothers and DreamWorks found it imperative to ensure that the film had a big enough opening weekend that it implied blockbuster to the movie going public. In short, he claimed that the distributors decided that they needed a big enough opening weekend so that other members of the movie going public would feel they had to see it because everybody else already had. In a way, this marketing trick worked because the film debuted to a $9.3 million opening weekend. However, in the UK, many audience members walked out of the screening and many complaints were made to the Advertising Standards Authority and to trading standards. So perhaps this bait and switch marketing technique wasn't the best way to advertise a film after all. However, the manipulation of audiences using trailers isn't something reserved only for big bosses like DreamWorks and Warner Brothers. In fact, there are now YouTube channels dedicated to recutting the original trailers of films into something completely different in tone and style. Films like Forrest Gump, Despicable Me Too and The Shining have all been subject to this recut treatment. YouTuber Bobby Burns has a specific playlist entitled What If Was A Movie? These videos work especially well when they take a really well-known and popular film and turn it into something completely different. For instance, what if the Disney animated family classic Frozen was a horror film? Do you want to be a snowman? What have you done? 
your power will only grow. We'll protect her. I don't want to hurt you. It's perhaps most interesting to note that no new footage is added and the original footage isn't changed at all. The changes come from new taglines, different music and title cards in order to make the viewer feel like the trailer has a different meaning. So using different tones and styles, an original sequence from the film goes from having one meaning or one emotional response to the total opposite. So that concludes our journey through the world of trailers and how big studios can make them good or bad. We've learned a lot and we hope that you have too. And we also hope that you've kind of enjoyed this journey. I've been Daisy Richards and bye now.